Good evening and welcome. I'm Dwight McBride, president of the New School, and I am so pleased to welcome back to the New School the National Book Foundation, presenter of the National Book Awards. For over 20 years, the New School has hosted the National Book Award finalist reading. It's a partnership that is both an honor and a source of great pride. I want to thank our colleagues, Ruth Dickey, the foundation's executive director, and Anna Dobbin, associate director of awards. And here at the New School, it is Professor Luis Jaramillo, director of the graduate program in creative writing, who is the lead collaborator, facilitator, and enthusiast for this partnership. I am so proud of the long list of New School alumni, students, and faculty members who have been National Book Award finalists and winners. This list includes distinguished authors such as W.H. Auden, James Baldwin, Grace Paley, Frank O'Hara, Sigrid Nunez, and just last year in the category of young people's literature, Kaysen Callender. The study and practice of writing has always held a special place among the New School's distinctive academic offerings and progressive intellectual culture. And like the best New School programs, it has continually evolved to remain fresh and relevant. So this event is a perfect match for the New School. It is such an important and wonderful celebration of authors and a very public way to lift up words and ideas that are profound, provocative, and transporting. So in the spirit of inspiration, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite quotes about the transformative power of books from James Baldwin. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was Dostoevsky and Dickens who taught me that the things that tormented me were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. Now, like Baldwin, our National Book Award finalists this year know well the power of writing to remind us of our human connection with one another. And that interconnectedness creates worlds of possibility. We're excited to hear from this year's finalists and we extend our warmest congratulations to them all. And now I'd like to hand it over to Ruth Dickey from the National Book Foundation. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 National Book Award finalist reading. Thank you, President McBride, for the introduction, and thank you to the New School team, Luis Jaramillo, Lori Lynn Turner, and Lizette Boer for hosting us again this year digitally for one of the most meaningful evenings of the National Book Awards celebrations. Tonight, we're gathered to celebrate the 2021 National Book Award finalists. For the second time in our 72-year history, it's a gathering that's taking place entirely online. But that doesn't lessen its power or the great privilege and joy we feel in honoring work we'll be celebrating together tonight, tomorrow, and for years to come. We're so grateful to be able to gather through the magic of technology and to celebrate your work and your words, which matter more than ever. Collectively, we need the transformative power of literature. We need opportunities to be together to say, this is what we believe books can do. Tonight is truly special, and I'm so glad we'll be spending it with all of you. Before we get much further, I want to gratefully acknowledge the heroic effort of our 2021 awards judges who read over 1,890 submissions this year and then narrowed that number to 25 finalist books. These finalists represent some of the most remarkable work being published today, and we cannot be more pleased to honor these books. The events that surround the National Book Awards are what we're best known for, but it's worth reminding that the National Book Foundation hosts educational and public programming across the country year round. Our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. Through the pandemic, we've rethought everything we do. We rethought our education programs and found a way to bring them online, as well as to make sure that our Book Rich Environments program, a partnership with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, still got books out to children and families in public housing in safe, socially distanced ways. 
We brought our NBF Presents programming online in partnership with book festivals and, part and partners to foster dialogue through literature. We continued Literature for Justice, a program that uses books to help shed light on the issues of mass incarceration. With the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and in collaboration with the Academy of American Poets and the community of literary magazines and presses, we launched the Literary Arts Emergency Fund, distributing $3.5 million in relief funding to 282 of our fellow literary arts organizations. And this year, we're continuing that work with a second $4.3 million round of relief funding. At this moment, our work has never been more necessary. And we do all this because we believe in the unparalleled power of books. Tonight's finalists are a wonderful reminder of why. <clears throat> Excuse me. These 25 titles delight in all the forms literature can take, all the voices it can include, and all the ways it can connect us to an idea, a place, a community. These books will stay with you the way great art always does. We feel so lucky to be here tonight with you, to experience together the stories and voices of these noteworthy authors and translators. My dear finalists and readers tonight, please read for two minutes. There's a large group and we need to make sure that our audience does not revolt. Thank you to our finalists, to their teams, friends, and family, and to our many sponsors who make what we do together day in and out possible. Penguin Random House, Central National Gotsman, Amazon Literary Partnership, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Hachette Book Group, HarperCollins Publishers, the New York City Mayor's Office of Movies and Entertainment, and Simon & Schuster. Thank you to the board of the National Book Foundation, the Book Council, and the staff, Meredith Andrews, Andrew, An Anna Dobbin, Andy Donnelly, Anya Kuypers, Natalie Green, Taylor Michael, Ali Romero, Jordan Smith, and Meg Tansy. Thank you for the work you do every day, all year long. This year's National Book Awards will be held online on November 17th. The National Book Foundation account will be put will put in the comments the link to RSVP to the 72nd National Book Awards, and we hope that you might consider donating to our organization in support of the work that we do. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. If you love these books, please support your local independent bookstores who champion books to make sure they find their readers. Please check these books out from your local library. And in the comments, the team will be putting in links to bookshop.org as well, so you can click through to purchase. On behalf of all of us at the National Book Foundation, we thank you. And we hope you enjoy this evening of pure literary magic. So this is how tonight will work. There will be five groups of readers, each group consisting of one reader from each of our five categories, young people's literature, poetry, nonfiction, and translated literature. The translated literature author will read briefly from the book in its original language, then the translator will read the same passage in English, giving us a sampling of Arabic, Chinese, French, and Spanish. I will be back to introduce each new group of five. So for group one, Amber McBride, Jackie Wang, Taya Miles, Jason Mott, and Samar Yazbek, the author of Planet of Clay, which was translated from Arabic by Larry Price. And now, group one. Hello, my name is Amber McBride, and I'll be reading from Me, Ma. Moths. Blossom in four stages because they are very good at poker and don't want to show all their cards at once. Egg, harden, caterpillar, grow, cocoon, rest, moth, live. This is how it goes. Egg is nothing special. We are all egg at one point. Then caterpillar, spotted and furry, like a mustache snatched from a face. Cocoon is the miracle. When the caterpillar literally melts sticky and soupy into a slop and reassembles itself as a moth, Imagine stepping out of the pot as Medusa. Imagine you, your DNA holding the secret to snake hair and stone men. Imagine being prepared to die just to fly for a few weeks in the sky. It's like you're doing so great at living small, almost mastered reigning in your ra ravenous joy. Then a boy with lava hair and a poet mouth swaggers in wanting your number. 
He smokes when he shouldn't. And he always taps, keeping time with his hand, which I imagine are softer than the mist that hovers on mountaintops. That is why I imagine when I fall asleep the night before the last day of junior year. And for the first time in a long time, I'm not breaking in half in the back of a car. For the first time in a long time, I feel my ancestors. And I think of my gray bearded grandfather and the magic he taught me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jackie Wang, and I am the author of The Sunflower Cast a Spell to Save Us from the Void. And hello to everyone at New School. This poem is titled Waiting for Girdle. First of all, no one will survive money. Of course, I understand this poem, and by that I mean I understand what it means to be a disappeared writer who wakes to tinnitus like all my life is this morning tinnitus, cause the soundtrack to my life is exhaustion. Whereas those subalpine, I mean those sibylline, those sumptuous buttes of the celestial order have got a kinder oral factory, atmosphere symphony factory to make the day leap with a plangent start. A dream comes to me and I am in a classroom being tested no one is present to administer the test. I must be here to test myself. We know how that will go. What makes this dream interesting is that I'm waiting for someone I do not know, i.e. a stranger. And then I'm outside in the desert and it's cold. It's a vacant rodeo and I'm still waiting approach already. Who said is this woman of color ontology this waiting, Debbie knows and loves the poem of waiting and all the great poems of waiting. Tennyson's come into the garden mod, which may or may not be a poem of waiting, though we did have to wait to look it up on the computer. Between remembrance and reenactment, there is waiting. But I truly believe we're not waiting to become our better selves that we're already so great as it is. We are aureoled beings doing our being thing. It's not easy being alive, this I know, but sometimes the moon is such that you just kind of slide into the glory hole that is your life, the brave freewheeling musicality of existence. Thank you. Hello, I'm Taya Miles, and I will be reading from All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake. Here in these pages, we take up a quiet story of transformative love, lived and told by ordinary African-American women, Rose, Ashley, and Ruth, whose lives span the 19th and 20th centuries, slavery and freedom, the South and the North. Their love story is one of sacrifice, suffering, lament, and the rescue of a tested but resilient family lineage. By loving, Rose refused to accept the tenets of her time, that people could be treated as property, that wealth was a greater value than honor, that some lives had no worth beyond capital and gain. Hers is just one telling example of refusal for the collective experience of enslaved Black women who practiced love and preserved life when all hope seemed lost. Even when she relinquished her daughter to the slave trade against her will, Rose insisted on love. Despite and during their separation, Rose's value of love prevailed. The emotional bond between mother and daughter held longevity and elasticity, traversing the final decade of chattel slavery the chaos of the Civil War and the red dawn of emancipation before finding new expression in the early 20th century, just as a baby girl, the fifth generation of Rose's lineage, Ashley's great granddaughter was born. Just as remarkable as the story of women who dare to insist on love is preserved on an antique sack, which once held grains or seeds. 
traces of the abused and adored, the devalued and the salvaged, the lost and the found accrue in this one of a kind object. A mother bears the sacrifice of her daughter. A daughter carries on amid unspeakable loss. A descendant heaves the harrowing tale into the 20th century, and we have the chance to be the better for its arrival here on our doorstep. Through the medium of Ashley Sack, we glimpse the visionary fortitude of enslaved Black mothers, the miraculous love Black women bore for kin, the insistence on radical humanization that Black women carried for the nation, and the immeasurable value of, of material culture to the histories of the marginalized. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jason Mott, and I am reading from Hell of a Book. <clears throat> Please don't do this, she spoke to the blue lights shimmering in the front yard. Soot wanted to follow her, but he didn't have the courage to disobey her. So he climbed upon the old couch and squinted out of the window with his heart beating in his ears. Outside, caught in the blue and white lights, Soot saw two shadows. One tall and lean, one square and hard. One stood with his hands in the air, the other with one hand on his hip. He knew from the lankiness of the shadows which one was his father. Mama, Soot called, but his mother did not hear him. She was out on the stairs with her hands in the air, calling her husband's name. William, she called. Then the world exploded. His father's shadow fell to the ground. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samari Esbeck, the author of The Planet of Clay. لا أعلم إن كنت مهتما بملمس الأوراق أو كنت تفعل كما أفعل حين تلامس أصابع سطحها ولن يفيدك أي تفصيلا أضيفه حول أصابعي حين أمررها فوق الأسطر التي دونتها يداي أفكر في أمر الآن وهو أنني لو بسطت هذه الكمية الضخمة من الأوراق المكدسة داخل علب كرتون فهي ستكفي لسمع طائرة ورقية بحجم الطائرة التي تحلق فوق رأسي Thank you. Hello, I'm Larry Price, and I'm the translator of Planet of Clay by Samari Isbek. I don't know if you care how the paper feels, or whether you're like me and run your finger over its surface, and it's no use adding anything else about my fingers and how I trace them over the lines my hands have written. I'm thinking something now, and it's that if every sheet of paper piled up in these cardboard boxes were laid out flat, they could make a paper aeroplane the size of the plane circling over my head. But don't think that my worries might be much to anyone but me. Everything I'm writing to you can vanish, and it will be a strange fluke if you have the chance to read it, like the fluke that made me so different from other people. Thank you. Beautiful to hear these words in your voices. One of the biggest changes in the past couple of years is the addition of tran the Translated Literature Award in 2018. It was the first award added at the National Book Foundation in over two decades, and the Translated Literature Award adds a global perspective, honoring books from all over the world that are published here in the United States. Pretty extraordinary. If you want to see who will win the fourth ever National Book Award for Translated Literature and all of the other categories, young people's literature, poetry, nonfiction, and fiction, please consider watching this year's awards on November 17th. We will also be awarding two Lifetime Achievement Awards to Karen Tay Yamashita and the librarian Nancy Pearl. You can RSVP at the link in the chat. And now, back to our readers. Group two brings us even more fantastic authors. Kekla Magoon, Hua Wynn, Nicole Eustace, Robert Jones Jr., and Benjamin Labatut, author of When We Cease to Understand the World, translated from Spanish by Adrian Nathan West. And now, group two. Hello, 
Hello, I'm Kekla Magoon, reading from Revolution in Our Time. Early in the morning on May 2nd, 1967, a group of 30 Black people piled into cars in Oakland, California, and struck out on the highway, headed for the state capitol in Sacramento. They were going to protest a bill called the Mulford Act, a piece of gun control legislation which had been introduced specifically to prevent members of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense from carrying the weapons they used to protect citizens from police brutality. The powerful image of Black men with guns on the steps of the California legislature put the Panthers on the map. For most of white America, that image defined the Black Panther Party. But Black Americans watching from around the country recognized the deeper promise of social transformation that the Panthers offered. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense would not remain a small Oakland-based organization much longer. May 2nd, 1967 marked a significant turning point, the moment when the Black Panthers' posture of armed self-defense became a matter of national awareness. This new militancy rolled across the American landscape like an earthquake trembling the foundation of the Republic. On the surface, such an earthquake seems quite sudden. It catches people off guard. The ground begins to roll and it is all too easy to lose footing. Solid things, things designed to be immovable, tilt suddenly, casting all confidence askew. In moments of nervousness and fear, when the ground is shaking and it feels as if the world might come crashing down, Sometimes people forget that earthquakes are in fact not sudden, nor do serious political movements arise in one fell swoop. Nothing happens overnight. The major turning points of history are seismic, born of eons of slightly shifting geologic plates. They do not emerge from nowhere. They are born of deep unrest. Thank you. Hello. I'm Hua Wen, and I will be reading from A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure. Crow Pheasant. You can wave off the gnat or join it in the next life. Live two hours plus three days or 800 years like an 800-year-old banyan tree. Beat the drums of spring for the near me new moon. I kick the wicker dog, kick it hard to explain the ancient joke, how to be vast and slow compassion, the strange girl you named high up in the pond sky. But you didn't know how to spell reckon very well. You misspelled reckon and hooked me into a graffiti of surrender. Grow old bones to eat pain, fuck off renewal candle and burn the metaphor. Despite claims of no birds in Vietnam because of our constant eating aggression, who wants to hear about your Asian North American experience anyway if I write flowery and incomplete? We bird you to the sky and suffering released there. We cry city mountains. I came to tame with a song bowl, a sung swap to dynamite the arthritic as an expansion trick, a true jade vibration that travels as it sounds, sending a vibration up the face, pyramid shaped. She was born in a halo. Delta mouth begins the sentence, coop, coop, coop call of pheasant crow. The next poem we sing to appears on the back of this postcard insert included in the book. We sing to wing a string. We sing to wing again. Thank you. I'm Nicole Eustis. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking tonight from the Napa Hoking, now often called New York, and I'm reading from Covered with Night, a story of murder and indigenous justice in early America. Sawan Taney lingers through the night with his wife, Winnie Piweta, keeping anxious watch. Come morning, she finds that he has breathed his last breath. Alone with his corpse, she flees the cabin 
seeking help. It proves to be the last time she will ever see him. For when she returns, she finds his body has been taken, removed, and buried. My friends have killed me, were Sawantini's last recorded words, an utterance that speaks volumes about the social world of the Seneca. Winnie Piweta will remember those final words and do all she can to honor them. That single line says so much about who Sawantini was and what he hoped for, to be a leader who linked Indians and colonists together in friendship. Anglo-Pennsylvanians can scarcely imagine the sort of unified ties that Indians are striving for. Sawantini and his wife, Winnie Piweta, embodied this process, bringing together through their marriage an Iroquoian people, Sawantani Seneca, with an Algonquin one, Winnie Piweta Shawnee. In these difficult days in the Susquehanna Valley, Native nations are shuddering from encroaching stress on all sides, from raids by Native peoples to the North and South, and from in colonial wagons and pathogens rolling in from the East. In times like these, strategies and ceremonies of alliance matter as never before. In sharing their cabin, their lives, and their work, Sawan Taney and Winnie Pueda exemplified how separate peoples could come together to provide for and protect one another. Like a native hamper made of bark and bound with corded twine, native marriages allow husbands and wives to remain members of different nations yet bring their lives and their peoples together. Wood and fiber combine to form a pack fit to carry many burdens. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Jones, Jr. And I will be reading from my novel, The Prophets. This is why Isaiah and Samuel didn't care why they clung to each other even when it was offensive to the people who had once shown them a kindness, it had to be known. And why would this be offensive? How could they hate the tiny bursts of light that shot through Isaiah's body every time he saw Samuel? Didn't everybody want somebody to glow like that? Even if it could only last for never, it had to be known. That way, it could be mourned by somebody, thus remembered, and maybe someday repeated. Well, shit. If their faith was to be found in two piles of dust that would be swept up and scattered, then damn it, let there be a storm beforehand. Let the blood run down and the heat too. If the snap was to come, at least they would have known what it was like to be each other, be really in each other before the brokenness was brought to bear. This was the bomb. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Labatut and I'm the author of When We Cease to Understand the World. La singularidad se esparció sobre su mente como una mancha, sobrepuesta encima del infierno de las trincheras. La veía en las heridas de bala de sus compañeros, en los ojos de los caballos muertos en el barro, en el reflejo de los cristales de las máscaras de gas. Su imaginación había quedado atrapada por el tirón de su descubrimiento, Con espanto, se dio cuenta de que si su singularidad llegase a existir, duraría hasta el fin del universo. Sus condiciones ideales la convertían en un objeto eterno que no crecía ni menguaba, sino que permanecía siempre igual a sí mismo. A diferencia de todas las otras cosas, no cambiaba con el devenir y era doblemente inescapable. Dentro de la extraña geometría espacial que creaba, La singularidad se ubicaba en ambos extremos del tiempo. Uno podía huir de ella hacia el pasado más remoto, 
o viajar hasta el futuro más lejano solo para volver a encontrarla. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Nathan West. I'm the translator of Benjamin Lavatut's When We Cease to Understand the World. Even immersed in the chaos of war, the singularity spread across his mind like a stain, superimposed over the hellscape of the trenches. He saw it in the eyes of the dead horses buried in the muck, in the bullet wounds of his fellow soldiers, in the shadowy lenses of their hideous gas masks. His imagination had fallen prey to the pull of his discovery. With alarm, he realized that if his singularity were ever to exist, it would endure until the end of the universe. Its ideal conditions made it an eternal object that would neither grow nor diminish, but remain eternally as it was. Unlike all other things, it was immune to becoming and doubly inescapable. In the strange spatial geometry it generated, the singularity was located at both ends of time. One could flee from it into the remotest past or escape to the furthest future only to encounter it once more. Thank you. Thank you so much to you all. It's truly special to be able to hear you all read from your incredible work. One thing that we do at the National Book Foundation is partner with community colleges, with HBCUs, and with book festivals to get National Book Award honored authors speaking across the country. Before the pandemic, this meant authors traveling on behalf of NBF to Idaho, to Tennessee, to Florida. Right now, though, it means we're doing a number of online events in partnership this fall, but the joy and energy of reading is still there, and we're planning trips in the spring to the Mississippi Delta, the Appalachians in Kentucky, and to Kansas. Supporting the work of authors through purchasing their books and also by attending events like these and by supporting the organizations that support them is incredibly important. And now, back to our readers. Introducing group three, Kaya Lukoff, Douglas Kearney, Grace M. Cho, Laird Hunt, and Nona Fernandez, author of The Twilight Zone, which was translated from the Spanish by Natasha Wimmer. Now for group three. I'm Kaya Lukoff, reading from Too Bright to See. As we all sit around the table, I have a sudden glimpse of what we look like from the outside. Like I'm hovering above the table looking down. Six girls with styled hair, some with bodies that are more uh, developed than others and clothes from the right stores in the mall, talking and smiling like they all know some secret. And one person in grubby clothes, hair that isn't anything, sitting right in the middle like an ink splotch. It gives me that same creeping sensation I get at home when I accidentally glance into a mirror and the face looking back isn't mine. I suddenly wonder if this is what it's like being a ghost, looking at the world from above, apart from it, but wishing you were a part of it. Maybe ghosts haunt people because they want company. If this scene happened in a book, the older girls would be a little mean to me, not outright bullying, but subtly making sure I know I'm not one of them. Emily and Isla would join in because we were never really friends. And if this were in that same book, Moira would start acting like them, finally shedding her old friend like appealing sunburn, and I would be sad and confused. But that doesn't happen, and I'm slowly pulled into the group. When I ask a question, they listen. One or two of them answer. Emily wants to know about the different sports clubs, and Isla asks if there's a school newspaper. I don't talk much at first because I haven't done anything this summer except be haunted by the ghost of my dead uncle slash maybe trans aunt. And that's not the first impression I want to make, but the girls work at drawing me into conversation. And soon we're talking about our favorite subjects in school, bad cafeteria food, and whether it's better to do your homework first thing on Friday or save it till Sunday before bed. Moira sits next to me, sometimes leaning her body into mine a little, and I press back into her. I can't be the easiest person to stay friends with, especially right now, but she's trying. And that means more than anything. Thank you. Hi. I'm Douglas Kearney, and this is Show, the title poem from Show. Some need some body, or more to ape sweat on some site. Bloody pearl or dirty spit, hocked up for the show, who gets eaten? Rig body up, bow bow to breeze a lazed jig, and sway to Griggs good fiddling. Pine deep dusk, a spot where stood body, thus they clap 
when I mount bonk, jig up the lectern, bow to say it's all good. We gathered, withstood the bends of dives deep darker, they clap as I get down. Sweat highlights my body. How meats die bloody, look fresher for show wing. I got deep, spit out my mouth, a rigid red rind, bloody melon, ha! no sweat, joking. Nobody knows the trouble, rig full of dares. Show why fix this mess, spit in tragedy's good eye. This one's called jig. Girl, gogglers, then bow housefully. They clap, be misunderstood. Hang notes high or deep, make my tongue a bow. What's the gift? My good song box? The gift! Jingle nickels from deep down my craw. They clap, I so jolly. Sat, stood on that bank, body picked over, blood e rotto, Braxton sweat e brow syndrome. Spit out a sax bell, rig a negrocious show of feels for Sweat equals work, bloody ink pot of body. I stay nipped in, show never run dry, rip rustly. I spit out stressed feet, lines jig, ha, 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 good one that I is, bow deep, but not out, stood shining dim, they clap, waves slapping hulls, deep, don't mean sunken, good, not yummy, right, bow, blanch with foam, jig jigs, this one's called they clap. Barrow, so much depends upon dead. Stood I on that bloody rise of sweet body. There you is too. Sweat it lets. They clap, right? Some ass post spit to lift. I said, show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Grace M. Cho, and I'm reading from my memoir, Tastes Like War. While I had already spent years thinking about my mother's situation, the work of systematically breaking it down began in my first year sociological methods class in which we were asked to write weekly research questions. I never explicitly mentioned her in the assignments, but she was present in the subtext of everything I wrote. What structures and systems and geopolitical events created a social context in which she dared to transgress her societal norms to enter the sex industry. Once there, what small actions and gestures slowly eroded her self-esteem? What large-scale transactions crushed her psyche? Once out, did the same things happen all over again, just in a different time and place? The answers to these questions were not at all obvious. Later, after I had spent a decade on my investigation, my sister-in-law would say that she had only told me because I ought to know, because she was speaking woman to woman. Somehow she expected me never to do anything with those words except to lock up the secret myself and never speak of it again. When I had made it my life's work to openly interrogate the words that had haunted me, when I had written hundreds of pages about them, my sister-in-law revised the storyline. Your mother was a cocktail waitress, nothing else. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether she was a cocktail waitress or a prostitute or something in between, because those words, when they were first spoken, changed me. Your mother used to be a prostitute. That bit of new information was so huge that it erased my old memories. It made me forget all those years when she was my mama, the woman who called me Crust Girl and was famous for her blackberry pies. Thank you. Hi, my name's Laird Hunt and I'm gonna be reading from the start of Zori. She had never liked to dream. After diphtheria took first her mother and then her father, she was raised by an elderly aunt who told her that people were born dreaming of devils and dark roses and should beware. This aunt, whom her, her dying father had only called on reluctantly, for she had drunk too deeply from the cup of bitterness after a badly failed marriage, shook and scolded Zori vigorously when, as happened frequently during the first months, she woke up crying. If she woke up screaming, she received a slap. Sometimes she received, received a slap anyway, either because of what she was leaving behind in the dizzying hallways of her head or what she was waking to Zori came to harbor what proved a lifelong distrust of the deep hours 
as her aunt referred to them, when the mind played tricks on itself. Days were different. Zori ran. She skipped. She won a prize at school for turning the best cartwheel. She and the other children played with hoops and balls in the yard. No one could climb a tree as quickly as she could, and there were only two boys in the school who could beat her at arm wrestling. The teacher, Mr. Thomas, would take them on long walks through the woods and across the fields. Often on these expeditions, they were asked to collect interesting objects. Zori would run back and forth like a dog working a field, her quick hands flashing down to the ground and up again, heart pounding. She would bring her discoveries to Mr. Thomas for inspection. He would lift each leaf or mushroom or insect close to his face or up to the light or under his magnifying glass and with Zori leaning over his shoulder or even holding the magnifying glass herself, murmur, yes, very interesting. This is a good specimen, Zori. Well done. Thank you. Hola, soy Nona Fernández, escritora chilena. Y voy a leerles un trozo de La Dimensión Desconocida de Twilight Zone. Imagino y puedo hacer hablar a los muros. Interrogo a las silenciosas casas vecinas, a las mudas ventanas que guardan información detrás de sus cortinas corridas. Imagino y hago testimoniar a los viejos árboles al cemento que sostiene mis pies, a los postes de la luz, al cableado del teléfono, al aire que circula pesado y no abandona este paisaje. Imagino y completo los relatos truncos, rearmo los cuentos a medias. Imagino y puedo resucitar las huellas de la balacera. Gracias. Hello, my name is Natasha Wimmer, and I am the translator of The Twilight Zone by Nona Fernandez. And I'm going to read a few words from the book. Imagining, I make the walls talk. I interrogate the silent houses next door, the mute windows harboring information behind drawn curtains. Imagining, I ask the old trees to speak. I ask the cement under my feet, the lampposts, the telephone wire the stale air circling this place. Imagining I complete unfinished stories, reconstruct half-told tales. Imagining I bring the bullet holes back to life. Thank you. That's so beautiful. Thank you each so much. We have two more groups of readers and we're so lucky to be able to do this event this year. When the pandemic made it evident we couldn't gather together this fall, for the second year in a row, we reworked our entire National Book Awards week, including the National Book Awards Gala. This gala is usually the major fundraiser for our organization, and without the tickets and tables from the awards, we're facing a significant budgetary deficit. We love this work. We want to continue to get books to children and families in public housing. We want to continue our educational and public programs to connect books to readers. We want to have a 73rd National Book Awards and we need you to make that all possible. Please consider donating to support the National Book Foundation at the link in the chat. Literary arts nonprofits like ours need your help now more than ever. We're so grateful to all of you for being here. And now back to our readers. In group four, we are lucky to have Melinda Lowe, Martina Espada, Lucas Bessier, Lauren Graf, and Gua Fei, the author of Peach Blossom Paradise, translated from the Chinese by Kanan Morse. And now, group four. Hi, I'm Melinda Lowe, and I'll be reading from Last Night at the Telegraph Club. In this scene, the main character of the novel, Lily, is visiting the Telegraph Club for the very first time. The rear of the stage was covered by a black curtain, and Lily wondered if someone was going to step out from behind it. She had been waiting for this for so long that these last few moments seemed interminable. She quivered in her shoes as she gazed at the stage, at the people seated near the edge, she was jealous of their proximity to that microphone. And at Kath, who was watching the stage just as she was, then there was a murmur behind them and all the people packed into their section turned toward the archway. 
Someone was making their way through the crowd. Lily couldn't see the person clearly, only the motion of others making way like a wave, but she followed the ripple and turned along with her neighbors as that person strolled through the audience and finally stepped onto the low stage and into the spotlight. Lily knew that this was Tommy Andrews' male impersonator. She knew that the entire point of the show was the fact that the performer was not a man. Someone nearby whispered, is that really a woman? And Lily squirmed with embarrassment because that question led her to imagine what Tommy's body looked like under her suit. And that seemed so disrespectful, like those men who had leered at them at the bowling alley. Lily felt a queasy, self-conscious confusion. It was wrong to stare, and yet Tommy was on stage and they were supposed to look. It would be rude not to watch. So she did. Thank you. My name is Martin Espada. I'm reading from my book, Fluters. This poem is called Death Rides the Elevator in Brooklyn. On a winter morning in 1968, my father left to walk the picket line. He rode the elevator in his black coat, hood over his head in the hour before daybreak. On the third floor, the doors opened. A white man waiting for the elevator stood there, peered at my father in his black coat and hood in his brown skin, then screamed and fled. The doors closed. My father laughed on the picket line that morning. He laughed for years. The guy thought I was death, he would say. Death rides an elevator in Brooklyn. Mugger, death, militant, death, Puerto Rican, death listening to the story. As the screaming man screamed louder with every telling, I never thought one day my father would be the man standing there waiting for the elevator doors to open. He did not stare or scream or run. He stepped into the elevator and the doors closed behind him. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lucas Bessier. I'm reading from my book, Running Out. It rained my last night on the farm, the first rain in months. The waters rode a wild wind with split lightning and booming thunder. My father woke me an hour before dawn and offered to follow me the muddy nine miles to Blacktop to make sure I didn't get stuck. The rain left puddles in the road, and they shone like mirrors under a waning moon. Dozens of little owls fluttered up in the yellow headlights. At the edge of mud and asphalt, my father parked the truck next to my car. We stood beside the rumbling diesel, looking out over the blue plain. Hundreds of flashing white lights, each marking the end of a pivot system, circled the horizon. They blink like stars over the plowed uplands and the dry riverbed and the lost springs and the bygone times, real or made up. I knew I would come back. We watched the lights. Imagine all of those gallons being pumped right now as we're standing here, he said. He shook my hand goodbye. He opened the door of the truck and then paused. You know, I think your grandmother, Fern, would want you to tell it like it is. He drove the truck slowly back down the road. Above me were clouds. In the clouds, the waters of the depths mingled with those of the skies. They drifted to destinations still unknown. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, this is Lauren Groff. I am going to be reading from Matrix, my novel. After Easter is the hungriest time, between the last of the winter stores and before the bounty of the garden. A family of peasant, peasants, peasants tired of starving, steals winter rye from the abbey's fields a half day's ride away and bakes the rye into bread. But there's disease in the grain, or perhaps it is cursed by the devil, and after eating it, some dance uncontrollably and sing naked in the streets. Others scream with terrifying visions, others go stiff and barely breathe. Nothing can drive out the disease, not praying, not bathing them in holy water, not tying them to their beds, not leaping out from the night to frighten them, not holding them by the ankle in the cold river, not beating them around the head with a yew branch, not burying them crown to toe in warm manure, not hanging them upside down from a high tree and spinning them until they vomit, not drilling a tiny hole through their skulls to let the bad humors out of their brains. The rumor spreads that the Abbey's lands are stalked by the devil, that those who eat of the Abbey's land are taking the devil into their bodies. Ah, Abbess Emma says, hearing past the music in her head to the predicament, and mutters that it's a short leap from the Abbey's grain going unsellable to the sisters themselves being agents of the devil. Nuns already are suspect, unnatural sisters to witches. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gefei. I'm going to read a piece of my work in the Red Flower Garden. Now, he feels that he has become two people. One is in the distance of the Red Flower Garden. The sun is rising in the morning. The mother is like a light bulb floating down the ceiling. She is sitting on his bed. She asks him, Why are you crying? The other is being held in the 隔绝的荒岛上，母亲没有答应交赎金，而他很可能回不去了。就像照镜子时常有的情景，他不知道哪一个更真切。恍惚中，他听见有人推门进来，浑身上下被血染红了。这个人悄无声息地走到他床边，静静地看着他，脸上布满了。Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kanan Morse, and I'm going to read an excerpt from my translation of Peach Blossom Paradise. Now she felt as if she had become two people. The first was in faraway Puji, where night was falling, and Mother floated like a shadow up to her room to sit by her bed and ask softly, Tosio, why are you crying? The second was imprisoned on a desolate island, her mother refusing to pay her ransom, giving her little chance of ever returning home again. As she often felt when standing before a mirror, it was hard for her to tell if the body or the image was more real. Amid her delirium, she heard someone open her door and walk in. A figure stood before her, stained head to toe in fresh blood. He walked noiselessly up to her bedside and regarded her, a look of extreme anguish on his face. Thank you. Wow, thank you so, so much. We have one final group of readers, and I'd like to take this time to thank once more our sponsors, Penguin Random House, Central National Gottesman, Amazon Literary Partnership, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Hachette Book Group, HarperCollins Publishers, the New York City Mayor's Office of Movies and Entertainment, and Simon & Schuster. We're grateful for our signature virtual table host, Macmillan, and our virtual table hosts, Baker & Taylor, Books A Million, Creative Artists Agency, Cushman & Wakefield, Ingram Content Group, The New York Times, El Pidio Villarreal, Wiley, and W.W. Norton & Company. We are supported by Bloomsbury Publishing, Bookshop, Candlewick Press, Grey Wolf Press, Grove Atlantic, Janklow and Nesbitt, Princeton University Press, ReaderLink, Yale University Press, and Zibby Books. And we are so lucky to have the support of Anonymous, Charles and Barbara Wright, and the Susan and Kenneth Wallach Foundation. We could not do this work without their financial support. 
And we could not do this event or the National Book Awards without the production team of really useful media who are currently behind the screen working to get all these finalists on the screen. Thank you as well to the captioner, Anthony Trujillo. And now on to our final group of readers. Shin Ying Kor, Desiree C. Bailey, Hanif Abdurraqib, Anthony Dor, and Alisa Schwa de Chupin, whose winter in Sokcho was translated from the French by Anissa Abbas Higgins. Now for group five. Hi, my name is Shin Ying Kor, and I'm reading from the graphic novel, The Legend of Auntie Po. Uh, my iPad is supposed to be. Sharing as well. There you go. <laughs> Logging a forest is like a dance. The loggers slide past each other, and sharp blades and soft humans and heavy logs jostle for space. Polly's a bore, but he's good as, at his job. Do you ever wish you could work out there with him? Mm, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. B, are you listening to me? Mm, yeah. What are you looking at? Oh, who? Who are you looking at? A new boy. He just came down from Wisconsin. He's from a logging family, just like me. Dad says he's a natural leader. He's young, but the men trust him. Dad says he'll be a foreman in two or three years. If he doesn't die first, he may. You said it's a dangerous job. What's gotten into you? I'm going for a walk. I need to get kindling for the stoves. I can go with you. No thanks. Why do I feel so bad? Be you just confiding in me about normal girl things. And I should like that. I don't like it. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, hi. I hear you've been telling stories about me. Yes, but I made you up. You're just a story. Wait, I can make things real with my brain? Be careful, Ami. It will be difficult. Um, okay, you didn't answer my question. Wait, what do I need to be careful of? Wait, I have questions. Ugh, even the gods I invent aren't that useful. <sighs> I wish B could see this. Uh, but... So thank you, and thank you. This poem is in honor of the Haitian Revolution. My hands, my womb, whittled to a tool to build what a white man sculled temple, his leaning empire of ash and bone his coffee, his cane, arrows towards the death of everything. The land chewed up, the skin forest, his god within the vulture's jaw. The island made into a wicked stain, a lump in the throat of my mother. But if not here, then where, crude shadow of home, my blood, my grief glistens the soil. The land and me stubborn kin. The land made me a new being, forge of a greedy flame. My blood already here. My gods breathing in the hills in the slow tilt of evening. My gods stir me into a battle song. My muck, my cane, my muddy island. My life, my death, my cliffs, my body's bloom. What smoke? What threadbare cry? What child strung between? What architect of light? What leaf for the wound? What mountain and scar? What keloid? What mother? What sweat in the eye? What sojourning soul? What thrust in the dark? What hole? What belly? What babe without breath? What route to the hills, what dance, what drum beat to call, what freedom, what body, what precipice of hope, what danger, what master, what whalebone, what poison meat, what pillage feel, what noise against the cane, what blaze, what sky, what name to call myself. Thank you. 
Hi again. I'm a. Uh, I don't know if I need to introduce myself again. You know, getting getting accidentally booted out of the reading, I was like, maybe the National Book Award actually did not want my book at all. I've been thinking this was a fantasy and that was like a, that could have been a giant thing. I'm Hini from Dark Keep. I'm gonna read a quick thing in honor of Mary Clayton from my book, A Little Devil in America. I would like to give Mary Clayton her roses. I would like roses to burst forth from the walls of every room Mary Clayton is in. I would like to give roses to every singer who had a name tied up in liner notes and not on the tongues of people who sang along to their pristine vocals. I would like to bring roses to the doorstep of the house Mary Clayton walked out of at midnight in 1969. And I would like to lay roses on the stool where she sat, her pregnant belly hanging over the edge while she sang murder, murder, murder. I would like roses to come out of the ground somewhere anytime a person's voice cracks under the weight of what it has been asked to carry. I would like to do this while the living are still the living, and I don't want to hear from any motherfucker who isn't with the program. I would like roses for Mary Clayton to fall from the sky whenever a gunshot echoes above, and I would like roses for Mary Clayton in the hands of whoever could throw the first punch but doesn't. I want the small red fist to come from the earth and slowly open wherever Meredith Hunter's body is or wherever his body had been. I want Mary Clayton to be as big as a rolling stone. I want teenagers to wear her face on t-shirts, and I mean her good face with her good afro and her fur coat and her father's eyes. I want record stores to stock the solo records of Mary Clayton in the front case, and I want them to play all the songs she sang alone with no one else. I want enough roses to build headstones for every person I love. I want the moment when the drums kick in on any version of Gimme Shelter. I want that feeling in my chest to always remind me what I'd miss if it were taken from me. I want shelter, and I don't even know what that means anymore. I want nowhere, nothing sacred. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Anthony Dore. I'm going to be reading from Cloud Cuckoo Land. He's 10 when beauty, the family's sway-backed old cow, goes into labor for the final time. For most of an afternoon, two little hooves dripping with mucus and steaming in the cold stick out beneath the raised arch of her tail. And beauty grazes as though nothing in the world has ever changed. And eventually she gives a spasm and a mud brown calf slides the rest of the way out. Omir takes a step forward, but grandfather tugs him back, a question on his face. Beauty licks her calf, its little body rocking beneath the weight of her tongue. And grandfather whispers a prayer and a gentle rain falls and the calf does not stand. Then he sees what grandfather saw. A second pair of hooves has appeared beneath Beauty's tail. A snout with a little pink tongue stuck between its jaws soon joins the hooves, followed by a single eye, and finally a second calf, this one gray, is born. Twins, both males. Almost as soon as the gray calf touches the ground, he stands and begins to nurse. The brown one keeps its chin planted. Something wrong with that one, whispers grandfather, and curses the breeder who charged him for the services of his bull. But Omir decides the calf is just taking his time, trying to solve this strange new mix of gravity and bones. The gray one suckles on its bent twig legs. The firstborn remains wet and folded in the ferns. Grandfather sighs, but just then the first calf stands and takes a step toward them as if to say, which of you doubted me? And grandfather and Omir laugh and the family's wealth is doubled. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Elisa Soua du Sapin, and I will read from the beginning of my book, um, Hiver à Sokcho. Il est arrivé, perdu dans un manteau de laine. Sa valise à mes pieds, il a retiré son bonnet. Visage occidental, yeux sombres, cheveux peignés sur le côté. Son regard m'a traversé sans me voir. L'air ennuyé, il a demandé en anglais s'il pouvait rester quelques jours, le temps de trouver autre chose. Je lui ai donné un formulaire. Il m'a tendu son passeport pour que je le remplisse moi-même. Yann Kéran, 1968, de Granville. Un Français. Il avait l'air plus jeune sur la photo, le visage moins creux. Je lui ai désigné mon crayon pour qu'il signe. Il a sorti une plume de son manteau. Pendant que je l'enregistrais, il a retiré ses gants, les a posés sur le comptoir, a détaillé la poussière, la statuette de chat fixée au-dessus de l'ordinateur. 
pour la première fois, je ressentais le besoin de me justifier. Je n'étais pas responsable de la décrépitude de cet endroit. J'y travaillais depuis un mois seulement. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Anissa Abbas Higgins, and I'm reading to you from my translation of Winter in Sokto. He arrived bundled up in a woolen coat. He put his suitcase down at my feet and pulled off his hat. Western face, dark eyes, hair combed to one side. He looked straight through me without seeing me. Somewhat impatiently, he, he asked me in English if he could stay for a few days while he looked around for something else. I gave him a registration form to fill in. He handed me his passport so I could do it for him. Yann Caron, 1968, from Granville, a Frenchman. He seemed younger than in the photo, his cheeks less hollow. I held out my pencil for him to sign and he took a pen from his coat. While I was checking him in, he pulled off his gloves, placed them on the counter, inspected the dust, the cat figurine on the wall above the computer. I felt compelled for the first time since I'd started at the guest house to make excuses for myself. I wasn't responsible for the rundown state of the place. I'd only been working there a month. Thank you. Wow. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much to all of our finalists. We are thrilled to celebrate you and your work. Once again, we hope that you will all join us for the National Book Awards on November 17th. Thank you again to the New School and thank you to each of you for watching. May you each continue to find inspiration, connection, and solace in books. Thank you and good night. <laughs>